out tonight. It's a beautiful night. I was just outside riding my bike, so I hope you guys got some of the weather today before it uh, heats up uh, in the weekend to come. So, um, yeah, I just want to say a little bit, and this is going to be a very informal talk, just about some of the really interesting uh, or exciting or dispiriting, depending on who you are, uh, mathematical and geometric issues around a problem that I think historically has not really gotten a lot of public attention, the, uh, the problem of redistricting. Um, and let me just show you what that looks like. So what you're looking at here, uh, this is the state of Wisconsin, the state I think most of us are in as we talk, uh, as we talk about this. Um, and if you see these like, little boundaries there, those are the 99 assembly districts. And I always start by asking like to see if uh, people know, like, well, especially people outside Wisconsin think it's very weird that there's 99 assembly districts in Wisconsin. I can tell you, they're like, why 99? Why not 100? Okay, who knows it? I wanna see who, I see some Wisconsin veteran voters out there on my screen. Why is it, why is it 99? Somebody unmute and tell me. Maybe to avoid a tie. That is a great wrong answer. Somebody always says it. It's, it would be a good reason to have there be 99 instead of 100, but it's not. The reason it's 99 instead of 100 is that according to the Wisconsin Constitution, um, every Senate district in the state has to be made up of three assembly districts. And so the number of assembly districts has to be a multiple of three. So it could be 102 if we've got a new state Senate district, or it could be 96, but it can't be 100. Um, so yeah, there's 33 state Senate districts. Tonight, I'm mostly going to talk about the assembly districts, but we could have a whole separate talk about that. Um, and then 99 uh, assembly districts. Um, and what you're looking at is the way this map looks like right now, a map that was uh, the result of a law called Act 43 that was passed in 2011. Um, it changes a lot. And the reason it changes uh, is because each assembly district has to have approximately the same number of people in it. And that seems obvious, by the way. It seems like, well, how could it not? It wouldn't be fair if um, some assembly district had tons and tons of people and others had only a few. Uh, one thing you quickly learn when you study this stuff is that until recently, there were almost no rules. So actually, until 1964, it was perfectly permissible to have assembly districts of vastly different sizes. And in fact, most states did. So the Supreme Court, in the famous case, uh, called Reynolds versus Sims in 1964 established this principle, which uh, we call one person, one vote. They called it one man, one vote, it being 1964, but we call it one person, one vote, um, which says that you can't have radically different sized legislative districts. To be fair, everybody has to have the same representational power, which means that every district has to be about the same size. But that creates new problems because under the old system, you might have, and this was the way it was in Alabama where they had this case, assembly districts based on counties, for example. And then they just stick to the boundaries of the counties. Well, now they have to be the same size, but of course, like people move, right? Um, years go by and the population shifts and a patch of land that used to have just about exactly 1 99th of the population of Wisconsin in it, uh, no longer does. And again, for the, um, you know, we know very well that here in Wisconsin, uh, the population of the part of Wisconsin we're sitting in right now, Dane County, uh, is growing. Uh, the population in the north is decreasing. So inevitably, um, these assembly districts you see today um, are not going to be constitutional after the next census takes place. Uh, well, what's taking place right now, and after those results come in, these districts are no longer going to be any good. Uh, we're going to have to draw new ones. And the whole crux of the issue we're talking about here is that it actually matters a lot how those districts are drawn. Um, and how to assess that is like a fundamentally mathematical question. So the next slide, there's gonna be a bunch of numbers on it. I think that's gonna be the only one with like a ton of numbers on it in the whole thing. But I really want us to look at these numbers because the crux is right here. Everything I really wanna say uh, is already on this, uh, well actually it's in the slide after this. So I want you to imagine an imaginary state uh, the state of Crayola, in which there are two political parties, the Purple Party and the Orange Party. And in this state, you know, we do, when we study something mathematically, we always try to make it a little simpler than it really is. So let's say there's just 100 voters, 60 of whom support the Purple Party and 40 of whom support the Orange Party. And let's say furthermore, that we have to uh, set up the state 
into legislative districts so that we can fill uh, the assembly of this state, which again, to make things simple so we don't have to look at too many numbers, uh, we're gonna say there's just five seats. Okay, there's just five districts in this whole mini state. Um, and there's lots of ways we could do this and I'm gonna show you four of them on the next slide. So um, in the first one, I just wrote D1, districting one. Um, there's three districts that have 15 purple voters and five orange voters. And then there's two districts which are a little more orange flavored, right? They have seven, there's one which has seven purple voters and 13 orange voters. And another one, which is a little closer, which has eight purple voters and 12 orange voters. But if you add up those first two columns, you'll see that just as I said, I wanna you know, make sure there's nothing on my sleeve and I'm not lying to you. Uh, the left, the purple column adds up to 60 and the orange column adds up to 40, just like it has to. Um, and you'll also note that each row has exactly 20 voters in it. In other words, this districting obeys the Reynolds versus Sims rule of the Supreme Court that every district is the same size. In fact, in this case, they're literally exactly the same size, 20 voters each. And actually, every single one of these four districtings I'm showing you on this chart has those two properties. They each have 60 purple voters and, uh, and 40 orange voters. And they each split the state of Crayola up into five equally sized districts of 20 voters each. But as you have probably noticed already, just looking at this, um, these districtings have vastly different outcomes in terms of what the legislature actually looks like. Um, so in the first one, there's three purple districts and two orange districts. In the second one, there's three districts that orange wins very narrowly, 11 to nine. And then there's two that are sort of blowouts for purple. And purple ends up with just two districts and orange has three. Uh, in the third one, that's kind of a, a little bit differently shaped where you have, there's not really any blowout orange districts here, but the, there's some that purple wins by a lot and you end up with four uh, purple districts and one orange district. And then in the fourth, possible district thing. Actually, this is an interesting one because this is the one where it's completely homogeneous. Like maybe if you imagine that this 60-40 ratio is exactly even in every city and town and village and hamlet in the state of Crayola. And so every district has that same 60% to 40% 40 40 ratio, which would be 12 voters to eight voters in 20 person district. Every single district has that. And the outcome is then that purple holds all the seats in the legislature. So actually at this moment, um, because somehow the crux is really here, all the meat is here. Let's actually take a second uh, and think about the question that's on the top of the slide. Which one of these is the most fair? And actually I wanna to add to that, it's not, I didn't put it on the slide, but also which one of them is the least fair? So let's actually take a minute, I'm actually gonna like literally time a minute on my phone and, uh, and think about that question and then we'll come back and, uh, and talk about it. If you're, I see some of you folks are by yourself and some have somebody with you. So if you've got somebody with you, you guys should argue about it now. And if you're by yourself, argue with yourself. It's good practice. Look, you can see my timeline, like how, how long we have left to discuss. Okay, running out of time. Okay. Okay, so um, if people have thoughts, uh, you can unmute or if you wanna type something in the chat, if you're sort of shy and don't like to unmute, you can do that too and I'll see it and, uh, and I'll, I'll report it. Usually if I'm doing, if I'm talking about this with like a group of people in a room, I would actually take a show of hands and if I were a Zoom master, there's probably some way to take a poll during the talk on Zoom, but I don't know how to do that. So I will take uh, input from you guys. Who wants to throw something out?
Yeah, I think I would toss out number two. Toss out number two. Okay. Oh, and I see now some things are coming in the chat. Um, somebody says that they think number one is the most fair and number four is the least fair. Um, and you sort of wanted to throw out number two. So number two and number four both have some, uh, some votes as maximally unfair, the ones that we should really get rid of. Um, I mean, what's, I mean, what's go, how do we react to these? I think what people really react to with number two is that purple is the majority party in the state and yet orange is the majority party in the legislature. I think that really strikes people as somehow not quite right. I'll say this, I think anytime we talk about this, I think probably the most people dislike number two and the second most people dislike number four. I think the people, reason people dislike number four is because it just somehow rubs one wrong that the orange party, which is a minority to be sure, but a rather sizable minority in the population has literally zero representation in the legislature. That kind of feels wrong to people. Um, and number one is generally the one that people like best. It satisfies a property that in the lingo of, of the districting is called proportional representation, which means that the percentage of seats that each party has is actually equal to uh, the percentage of seats I'm sorry, is the, the percentage of the statewide vote. In both cases, purple has 60% and orange uh, has 40%. So let me just say that, this, that the maps we have in Wisconsin, oops, I didn't need to go to that yet, um, don't really look like number one. They probably look a little bit more like number two. And we're gonna dig into that in a minute, but before I, I show you some pictures, let's try to understand like how does a map like districting two. How does that actually work? How is this magic done that somehow purple gets fewer seats while having more votes? Uh, and the answer is you create a lot of districts. If you're orange, you wanna create a lot of districts where you win, but not by too much. And you wanna pack your enemy's votes into just a few districts where that party completely dominates. So if you like, I mean, some people would say, we don't really like to talk about people wasting their votes because every vote counts, but I mean, this is the sort of, in the terminology that people use, um, all those votes in those last two districts are kind of wasted for purple. They are gonna win those districts. They would be much better off if some of those people uh, were moved into, uh, some of those first three districts, so they would have a chance. I mean, 11 to nine looks pretty close because we made the numbers really small and you're like, wow, they only won by two votes. But actually in American politics, a district you win by 55 to 45%, that's a pretty safe district for your party. A district where you sort of come in with that level of advantage is like, that's sort of what you want if you're a political party. It's, it's a district where you have a sizable lead that is probably not gonna be overcome. Okay. Um, and this kind of district map is exactly what we have in Wisconsin right now under Act 43. So um, this is a math talk, not a history talk, so I'm not gonna go through the entire complicated and somewhat dingy political history of the maps, but let's just remember that at the time of the last census in 2010, it was the first time in many years that a census came during a period of unified partisan control in Wisconsin. Scott Walker had just been elected governor and both the assembly and the Senate were in the house, uh, were in the hands of Republicans, which meant uh, that the state could prepare a map without any input from Democrats. In each of the last three cycles, we had divided government in this state, which led to an impossible wrangling over the maps. And the maps ended up being drawn in court because the legislature and the governor couldn't get together and agree on something. But with all three in the hands of the same party, uh, it was easy to agree. Um, and what that meant is that the map really changed a lot. So let me show you some pictures. Um, what you're looking at here is uh, not our part of the state, but a part of the state uh, near Milwaukee. Um, and this is the map, it was drawn by a court uh, that was in force between 2002 and 2010 here in Wisconsin. So you're looking at the assembly districts uh, in this particular part of Southeastern Wisconsin. Um, and uh, what I want you to note is that there's a very visible vertical line. Do you guys see it going right down the middle of, the, of this map? Okay, what is that vertical line? Who knows it?
Oh, so you guys are true Madisonians, like never getting over to the other part of the state. Okay, that vertical line, that, uh, that north-south line, that is the boundary between Milwaukee County and Waukesha County. And that is not only a county line, it is a true political boundary. I don't know if you guys ever like go to a Brewers game in the fall when it's like getting near election time and you, you know, you drive on Blue Mountain Road and you cross that line and you can see the political signs change. It's an extremely sharp transition as you cross from Waukesha County uh, into Milwaukee County. It happens like literally as you cross this street, which I think is 124th Street, where that north-south line goes. So this is a real political boundary. And you also will note that the assembly districts tend to stop at that boundary. So traditionally, that's, and it's actually in our constitution, that is the way that assembly districts are supposed to be drawn. I mean, we don't have a law that assembly districts can't cross counties. They certainly do. And indeed, some of the ones on this map do. But you're supposed to do it only if you need to, to make the populations work. And, you, and so you can see that more or less, there's Milwaukee County districts, and then there's Waukesha County districts. And there's a few that are combined, but mostly uh, that's the way it works. Um, let me show you how the districts look now. And they look really different. Whoops. So now that vertical line, it's still shown on the map. Um, but oh, by the way, thanks to the UW geography department who made these, I should credit the pictures. This is not made by me. I don't know how to make maps this good. These are made by our awesome geography department at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, you can still, it still shows you the vertical line between the counties, but now the assembly districts don't respect it at all. In fact, you have these kind of long rectangular districts, um, especially for, with 14, 13, and 15, uh, it's especially noticeable. And um, what are these drawn to do? Well, these places, there used to be a bunch of Milwaukee County districts, which were Democratic districts. And what they've done is they've carved out, and actually this map is great because uh, in my book, it's going to be in black and white, unfortunately, but here it's in color. And you can see those blue dots are Democratic votes and the red dots are Republican votes. So you can actually see the shift of color, like a political reality that you guys know very well. Um, you can see that they've taken um, some of these Democratic regions uh, in Milwaukee, that are in Milwaukee County, but not the city of Milwaukee. Like, I mean, you can see like West Dallas over there and Wauwatosa and like that's sort of what we're looking at. Um, those have been blended into bigger chunks of Waukesha County so that those votes essentially don't come together into extra Milwaukee County districts. They get blended into very Republican parts of Waukesha County uh, to make these districts which Republicans are going to narrowly win almost every time. Districts where Republicans have about a 10 point advantage. And you will notice, I said that those long rectangular districts cross the county line. But notice that there's more of them in the Waukesha side than there, are, than, there are, than there is on the Milwaukee side. And that is by design. So these districts are built to sort of ignore the previous traditional criteria uh, and instead um, kind of use up those Milwaukee County voters uh, in districts where their votes won't turn into Democratic assembly seats. Um, so this was a map that was drawn at, I mean, it's a crazy story. It was drawn in secret. It was drawn in a locked room uh, in a law firm uh, here in Madison. Um, nobody was even allowed to see it, including the legislators themselves, by the way. Very near the end of the process, each assembly member, each Republican assembly member, the Democrats weren't allowed to see it at all. Each Republican assembly member was allowed to see their own district, and they had to sign a non-disclosure agreement that they wouldn't say anything about what their district looked like, and they weren't allowed to see any of the others. So this was completely kept under wraps until uh, until it was brought to the floor uh, to a vote uh, and was passed very quickly before people really got to get a good look at it. Well, we've had a good look at it now for the last uh, eight years or so. Um, and let me tell you a little bit about how this map works. So one thing I wanna start with is the following slide. And I'll bet this is a number a lot of you guys have seen before, if you have like, thought about Wisconsin, uh, gerrymandering in Wisconsin. This is a slide from the, uh, the Rachel Maddow show. Um, and what it shows you is the following. In the 2018 elections, the one that we just had, um, you probably know that as of now, uh, Republicans hold 
uh, 63 of the 99 seats, and Democrats hold holding 36. Um, on the other hand, in terms of how many votes were cast for Democratic Assembly reps, 53% of all votes cast for any Assembly reps were cast for Democrats, and only 45% for, uh, for Republicans. So that certainly looks like we're seeing a scenario uh, much like that District 2 of Crayola that I showed you, where one side dominates in the popular vote. I mean, 53, 45, that's a lot, right? I mean, not, actually not that many statewide candidates win by that much here in Wisconsin, it's a swing state. Um, but the other side gets the large majority of the seats. However, I hate this slide and I hate this number, it's shown constantly, but I think it's incredibly misleading actually, because here's what you gotta remember. Um, the 2018 election, you know, the way this, um, this map works is to collect lots of Democrats in these extremely Democratic districts, right? Because after all, remember what happens to the rest, maybe I'll go back for a second. Um, what happens to the rest of Milwaukee County, the part that's left alone, it doesn't have these kind of more moderate, more mixed areas in the Western part of the county, you just have these very purely blue Milwaukee city districts. And of course, it's not on the map, but you guys know what District 77 looks like here in Madison, where I live. It looks just as blue as these. You have these extremely, uh, you know, 75% Democratic districts with lots of votes. And the truth is that especially in a Democratic leaning year like 2018, you probably know Republicans don't even run for these seats. Right, District 77, which is... Um, Actually, I don't even know. Does that stretch out to the Middleton Public Library? Am I, am I speaking in District 77 right now? Or is that in a different assembly district? Um, in mine, at any rate, there was no Republican candidate. And actually, there were 30 assembly districts where the Republicans did not even run in 2018. And what that means is that 53% figure is a little misleading because, for instance, in District 77 in Madison, that counts zero Republican votes. Well, there are Republicans in Madison. Not a ton, but there are, and it's a big city, and it adds up to a reasonable number of people. Um, and if you, uh, if there had been a Republican candidate for them to vote for, some of them would have voted. So I think this is a, this particular stat is kind of misleading. Um, let me show you a picture. I think is a little bit, uh, to me, is a little bit more compelling. And my son made this, I want to say, I'm proud of him, he's 14, and we're like sort of studying like how to take public data and like make nice pictures out of it. Um, so what you're looking at here is a whole bunch of different elections that took place in the state of Wisconsin between 2002 and now. And these elections are not assembly elections. They are statewide elections for individual candidates. And um, what I'm showing you is for each one of those elections uh, on, the, on the horizontal axis is what percent of the vote the Republican candidate got. And on the vertical axis is in how many of our 99 assembly districts did the Republican candidate get more votes than the Democrats. So this is, it's a little bit artificial perhaps, because if you look at, let's say, uh, the most recent gubernatorial election between Tony Evers and Scott Walker, um, they weren't running for assembly, they were running for governor. Nonetheless, you can still take each of those 99 assembly districts and, uh, and see how many Walker districts there were and how many Evers districts there were. And that gives you a pretty good sense of to what extent these districts are tilted in order to try to have a majority of them have more Republicans. Actually, I mean, this last election is an especially good one because as you know, it was very close. I mean, the statewide total was about 50-50. And actually, I think that's a better sense of where was Wisconsin in November 2018 than this business of the total assembly vote, um, which involves a lot of uncontested races. I mean, wouldn't you guys agree? You can nod if you agree that I would say at this, at least as of November 2018, Wisconsin was a pretty evenly split state in which we had seen lots of very close races. And in particular, this governor's race was extremely close, decided by, I think in the end, maybe like one and a half percent. Um, so let's see it on the map. Hey, can you guys see my cursor if I move it? Just a little arrow up here. Yes, I see some nods. Great. Okay, I'm going to find it for you. Um, so this, oh, I didn't say something very important. Some of the dots in this map are stars and some of them are circles. 
What's the difference? Stars is everything after 2010, everything with a new map. Circles is everything from 2002 through 2010. So we're kind of going back in Wisconsin history a little bit to elections past. Um, so uh, the this is the 20, sorry, this is the 2018 governor's race, which as you can see, the Republican got a little bit under 50% of the vote, right? Because Walker lost, as you may remember, and Tony Evers is now governor. But there were 63 assembly seats in which Scott Walker got more votes than Tony Evers, despite him losing. Um, a similar one is the 2016 presidential election, which I'm now searching. Uh, Donald Trump got a little more than 50% as of the popular vote in Wisconsin, as you probably also know. And he also won in 63 out of the 99 assembly, uh, assembly districts. But under the old map, it's really quite different. I mean, now move down a little bit. Um, and what you're looking at here with this little circle I'm circling, hmm, okay, this is a good piece of political history. Can anybody, anybody want to say, huh, what was like a big statewide election between 2002 and 2010 where the, the Democrat barely won but got just like a tiny shade over 50%? I know some of you guys were legal to vote in the last decade. All right, no guesses, no guesses. Okay, this is my man, John Kerry. Remember him, 2004 presidential election, extremely close here in Wisconsin, but Kerry did come away with Wisconsin's electoral votes. I think this is the closest one we've had in Wisconsin in the last 20 years, actually. I think he won by about a half a percent. Um, but in this race, the Republicans did not win in 63 districts. They won in, I think it was 51. And just more generally, um, this would be like a great Wisconsin trivia to see if like people could like identify which elections these were like from the, uh, from the numbers. Um, you see that the circles, which represent the old map, there's kind of like a nice line where the more, uh, the bigger a share of, seat, of votes the Republican gets, the bigger a share of seats they win in. And there's like a pretty nice regular uh, progression. Um, this one where the Republican 158 is, I think, uh, J.B. Van Hollen in 2010. I think he had the best showing for any Republican in any statewide election in this race for a long time. I'm not sure what was so great about him, but he was very beloved in, in 2010. He ran, that's the attorney general's race. Um, but the, the point I want to, it's sort of fun to talk about old timey Wisconsin politics, but the point I want to make is that you notice, right, that the stars are above the circles and they're like a lot above. In other words, a statewide election, which looks the same from the point of view of how many people actually like one candidate instead of the other, how many people are feeling Democratic versus feeling Republican, is going to translate into a lot more Republican seats under the new map than under the old. And actually, I, just, I never get tired of looking at this, actually, because it's kind of fascinating. <coughs> um, it's not COVID. That's just like I've been talking for a while. I've been bringing water down here. So it's um, the uh, there's something very... I mean, it's cool, but it's like also a little nauseating about how well this map is engineered because you'll notice that up here in this part of the graph when Republicans are doing pretty well, the gerrymandered map does not do very much. Um, the, perform the performance of Republicans under the old map is pretty much like that of the new. Where you really see it is where Republican performance starts to slip. This part of the graph where um, where if Republicans win 46, 48% of the vote under the old map, you definitely see them winning in a minority of, um, of assembly seats. Under the new map, they stay over 50. So they, that majority kind of stays alive and the Republican vote share has to go like really pretty far down under the new map 
before there's any chance of Democrats winning in the majority of seats. And there, right there, you see it. You see what this map is for. It's not really built to do very much for Republicans when Republicans are doing well. It's built to do something for Republicans when Republicans are doing badly, to insulate their assembly majority uh, against the will of a potentially hostile public. Um, this, this star here, by the way, you see on the left, that's Tammy Baldwin, 2018. And so she's the only Democrat to have done well enough statewide to have broken the gerrymander and won in a majority of assembly districts. And she had to win by 10 points to do it. And that's about what it takes. Um, and really no Democrat or Republican uh, other than Tammy Baldwin uh, has been able to win by that much in a fall election. Some of the Supreme Court races were that far apart actually. And you would see if I charted those in this chart, you see the same. Okay. That was a lot of chart. Uh, I hope this is fairly convincing that something is really going on with this map, that it's not a fiction that we're talking about, that this map has really changed uh, the way the assembly looks uh, in the state of Wisconsin. Um, maybe I'll show you one more picture because if you didn't find that convincing or even if you did but want more, I wanna show you in the court cases about these maps, what are we actually looking at? You bring an expert witness in, um, they will show you a picture like this. And I'm gonna tell you what this is. Um, because what will, what will Republicans say about that chart I just showed you? Well, I don't have to imagine what they would say. I mean, we have like lots and lots and lots of court cases with depositions and testimony, so I can tell you what they did say instead of, <laughs> I don't have to make it up. Um, they would say, well, look, yes, Republicans get more than their share of seats. Yes, things have changed since the last map. But we have a theory about that. I mean, yes, it's true that now like tons of Democrats are packed into these extremely, extremely Democratic districts. But that's not us, that's them. That's the Democrats. They chose to kind of all move to Madison and Milwaukee and live in these districts that are 70, 75%, 80% Democratic. We didn't do that. We didn't make them all live together. That's the Republican take, right? That, um, that this is something that it happened, you happened to see a big change when there was a new map, but that was happening naturally anyway. Like don't blame us uh, for Democrats all congregating together into these very tightly packed districts. So just to say a little bit without getting like too much into deep math, um, the, how do mathematicians assess gerrymandering? What we would do is the following, I mean, the opposite of gerrymandering is not gerrymandering. And what does it mean to not gerrymander? It means to draw the map without the intent of giving one party an advantage over the other. Well, how do you do that? That's hard, right? Because if the legislature is drawing the map, then they're gonna draw it in a way that favors themselves. And if Democrats uh, ran the legislature, don't think they're so perfect. I mean, they would do the same thing and have done it in other states. I mean, people look out for their own interests. So how are you gonna get maps that are drawn neutrally to party when nobody's neutral? Well, the answer is you get a computer to draw them because computers don't care. You can tell a computer what to care about. So you can tell a computer, hey, I want you to make a bunch of possible maps of Wisconsin and I want you to care about county lines, let's say. And I want you to care that the districts are not too crazily shaped. They have like pretty decent shapes. Um, and I want you to care, of course, they're all the same size but I don't want you to care how many Democratic districts and how many Republican districts there are. I want you to draw those districts um, in some random way, and then I want you to do that about 20,000 times, which is what we're looking, what we're looking at here. Um, and having done that, you can just then say, okay, for these 20,000 districts, now let's look at what happened. This one is for, this says WSA 12, this is for the 2012 assembly election. You can look and say, how many and how many of those seats did, Demo did Republicans get more votes? Um, and you see something kind of cool, which is, um, well, this was an election in which uh, the statewide vote share was about 50-50. It was very evenly split between Republicans and Democrats. And you see that actually in a way, the Republicans have a point. They're right about something because the most typical number of seats for Republicans to get is about 55. So even with votes are evenly split, there is this phenomenon of Democrats congregating in Madison and Milwaukee uh, and other uh, more densely populated districts around the state. And in some sense, wasting 
those votes, like getting a lot of votes that don't translate into a lot of seats. Um, so that effect is real, but it's not that big. It gets you to about a 55 seat Republican majority. And this little dot, WI, that's the actual Act 43 map. That's the map that we have. And in that election, um, the Republicans didn't get a 55 seat majority, they got a 60 seat majority. So what I like about this technique is it takes a lot of stuff that in the past was just kind of speculation about different politically minded people saying like, well, it could be this or it could be that, who knows, and really kind of pins down and makes precise, okay, how much of it is one thing and how much of it is the other thing. In this case, how much of the Republican majority was from natural clustering of Democrats in denser districts, about five seats, and then how much was the map, another five seats, about an equal amount. So if you, and God help you, because they're really long, but if you do like look at these court cases and look at the depositions and look at the incredibly hundreds of pages of testimony, this is the kind of thing that you see when mathematicians from around the country um, are brought in as expert witnesses to say, just how gerrymandered is this map? Can we identify it as, as in this case, a complete outlier among all maps? Something that's like not even in the middle of the distribution, but it's just like very weird. Like, and you'd say, okay, like no way would this happen by chance. This was done on purpose. This was engineered. Um, so I've already talked for like a half an hour and I think I've given you the basics of how gerrymandering works. Um, if you followed this story at all, I, then you know that our districts were challenged in court, were thrown out by a federal court uh, here in Wisconsin. In that case, it was appealed to the Supreme Court. It came back to Wisconsin. Meanwhile, uh, the Supreme Court heard two other cases for two other really horribly ger gerrymandered maps, uh, one in North Carolina and one in Maryland. Um, they kind of took them as a twin set because the maps in Maryland had been gerrymandered very badly uh, by uh, by Democrats, by um, led by a fellow named Steny Hoyer, who is actually currently, he is the, the House Majority Leader in the House of Representatives, who described himself as a serial gerrymanderer. That was his description. He said, look, I've been doing this for decades. That's what I do. Um, in order to make the state of Maryland have seven Democratic representatives in the House and only one Republican. Maryland's my home state, by the way. So it is kind of a Democratic state, but Definitely there are Republicans there and they definitely don't get their due in Congress. Um, North Carolina had a congressional map just as badly gerrymandered on the Republican side. So the Supreme Court kind of took these two cases together, uh, I think to avoid creating the appearance that they were taking a partisan side. And what they decided um, was essentially that they were unable to find any standard for gerrymandering they can use, which in practice you could call passing the buck. They basically said courts can't handle this this is too complicated. If Congress wants to do something about it, they have the power to do it, but we can't do it. So what that meant for our maps is that they're still there. They were not thrown out. The decision to throw the maps out was, uh, was dismissed as part of that case. Um, and now the year ends in zero, which means that we're having another census. Did everybody raise your hand if you filled it out? Did everybody already fill it out? Okay, because we got to compete with Minnesota for the highest participation. If they beat us, it's like really embarrassing. It's always like us or them. So, um, so, uh, so yeah, we're having our census, which means that our current districts are not going to be street legal anymore because we know the population is leaching out of the northern part of this state. And we know that people are moving to Dane County in droves to like work at Epic or whatever it is all those young people in East Washington do. Um, so we're going to have to have new districts. And how are they going to be made? What is the next step, given that they're not going to be these districts we have now? Okay, so it's going to look something like this. There's going to be a lot of fighting. Um, the, um, the legislature is going to draw maps, and those maps, without question, are going to be extremely favorable to Republicans, just like the maps we have now. I think there's very little question about what the leadership, Robin Voss and Scott Fitzgerald, are going to do with those maps. Uh, Tony Evers is gonna veto those maps. I think that is also extremely certain. What happens next? Hard to know. Uh, as you may know, Tony Evers has con is convening uh, a citizens districting commission, nine citizens uh, from around Wisconsin, uh, including one from each congressional district, who, um, who will draw their own map. Now this map has no legal force because Tony Evers doesn't have the legal authority to like 
put his own app in place, but it will be, uh, it's sort of a political move. It'll be presented as an alternative. Okay, you have your map that was made purely to benefit Republicans. Here's another map we could use, uh, which is just made by sort of nine random Wisconsin people, uh, people who are hopefully like non-political and don't have a partisan intent in mind. Um, what has happened in the past is that when in situations where the legislature and the governor couldn't agree, is that uh, it ends up in court and the court decides which one to use. In fact, last time we got, in 2000, what happened is that um, the court got the one from the legislature, the court got one from the governor, the court got proposed maps from all kinds of other people, like 16 and all. The court looked at them. They said, all these maps are unacceptable. Like we're making our own map and the judges like made their own map. And that was the map that we used, the one you saw uh, with the little circles. And I think that map was pretty okay, actually. Um, so that's one thing that might come next. That might happen. We might have, maybe that's the most probable thing. We'll have a court drawn map. Um, on the other hand, the legislature is pursuing a legal strategy to say that uh, in a big departure from basically the entire history of this state, actually, unlike any other law, this one we can just make without the governor's input and the governor doesn't have the right to veto it. So the legislature is going to go to the state Supreme Court uh, with a claim that they are constitutionally the, the people who are supposed to make the map and the governor is actually not involved. And then it was just some kind of like accidental misreading of the state constitution for like the last hundred years that we were like letting the governor have a say. Um, that strategy might work. Um, it just depends how the justices on the state Supreme Court uh, choose to vote. Um, what else might happen? I mean, there's like many, I only could draw two, could find a picture of two people arm wrestling, but there should be like seven or eight arms actually in here because there's a lot of actors. <laughs> um, you know, the House of Representatives has introduced uh, a federal bill forcing states to give up, forcing state legislatures to give up their, uh, their rights to redistrict to an independent commission. And the Supreme Court in this decision, in their buck passing decision, made it very clear that the US Congress has the right to do that and has the right to overrule the states and instruct the states as to how to choose uh, their district. So another thing that might happen is if we have a Democratic House, a Democratic Senate, and a Democratic president uh, in 2020, that could be another avenue uh, for reform. Um, and finally, I'll just say, around the country, what you're seeing is um, some state, in some states, voters have taken them into, the, into their own hands uh, with statewide referenda through the ballot initiative process. So a lot of states have a thing where if the legislature really pisses the people off enough, uh, people will vote for a statewide referendum to change the state constitution and take that power away from the legislature. And I wanna emphasize that um, gerrymandering is really unpopular. People don't like it. So I think it was very disappointing when the Supreme Court chose not to act, but I think for the people who worked so hard to bring these cases, many of them right here in Madison, um, that work was not wasted because there was a huge amount of attention to this very technical area of redistricting and gerrymandering, which there had never been before. Uh, and when people hear about it, they think it stinks. I gotta tell you, so you, you see these referenda winning um, in states that, are, um, that have a strong majority of one party and where that majority is the one doing the gerrymandering, you will see people in those states uh, voting against gerrymandering. You saw it in Utah where Utah voters voted to stop letting the Republican legislature, le legislature gerrymander that state. Um, and you see it in others, you see it in Missouri where uh, the citizens of Missouri who are, it's a strongly Republican state and they were going against a strongly Republican legislature, but people don't like it. And they will vote against it once they know about it. Uh, here in Wisconsin, as you probably know, we don't have a ballot initiative process. For better or for worse, I mean, there's reasons why there's a lot of mischief to cause ballot initiatives too. But in any event, we don't have that process. Or rather, we do have that process, but no ballot initiative can happen unless it's initiated by the legislature, which guess what, they're not gonna do. Um, so with that, um, I think I'm actually gonna stop because I've sort of said a lot and I've left a lot unsaid and I'm, I've just 
I just wrote about 20,000 words of my new book about this. So it's all like very much in my mind. So I'm happy to talk about any aspect of this uh, issue, whether in Wisconsin, nationally, internationally, or whatever you guys have on your mind. And thanks so much for coming in. I appreciate it. And we'll just leave these two guys up here to look at them while we, <laughs> while we discuss this. I think it sets the right tone. I have a question about Eldridge Gary. Is that what gerrymandering, is that who it's named after? It is named after Eldridge Gary, absolutely. I think I, because I don't know if his name was pronounced Gary or Jerry. I've been calling him Jerry because of gerrymander, but oh. uh, it's, it's named after, it's named after him because, uh, the sort of famous gerrymander was a sort of salamander shaped district that he drew in Massachusetts, but it was definitely not the first example of the form. And in fact, in a sort of little bit of local context, the first really famous well-known one in the United States was one that was designed to screw over our own James Madison, who was, um, who wanted to run for Congress in Virginia and his enemy, Patrick Henry, was like, I am not gonna let that happen. We think of all these guys as like, just all riding on a horse together, give me liberty or give me death, we're like, we're all on the same team. Once there was a country, like a lot of them really hated each other. So Patrick Henry was an anti-constitutionalist. He hated Madison and he was like, no way am I gonna let Madison uh, get elected to Congress. I'm gonna sort of stick his county in a district because he ruled the Virginia legislature. He was like the dictator of the Virginia. He was like the Robin Voss of, early American Virginia. And he did not like the Constitution, also like Robin Voss. Okay, I'm done with the official talk so I can say stuff like that now. Um, he did not like the Constitution. He didn't want to see it adopted. Um, and so he stuck Madison in a district with a bunch of counties that had voted not to ratify because he felt they would be against Madison. Who is Madison running against, by the way? Monroe. Only time two future presidents have ever run against each other for Congress. It was Madison versus Monroe in this district in Virginia. Um, and Madison had thought he was just gonna walk in. He was very mad, he, had been in, he was in New York, very comfortable. Uh, he had very bad hemorrhoids. He wrote to George Washington about it, to complain about it, that he had to like get in a carriage and like go back to Virginia and campaign. He sort of had to give his, gave his speech in front of a Lutheran church. It was very cold. He like lost part of his ear to frostbite. Um, and he was very cranky about the whole thing, but he did win. So the, gerry, that, the first gerrymander didn't really work. Like it was, um, he was able to uh, sell himself by extensive campaigning, even in some of these parts of his district that had been uh, hostile to the constitution, he was able to beat James Monroe. Um, so that was a very long answer to your question about whether the gerrymander is named after Elbridge Jerry, the answer to which is yes, but that's somehow not, I had a little more <laughs> info on that. Looks like we've got a question in the chat uh, from Jim. Oh, okay. you, oh yeah, I see yeah, it. Okay. You want to take a look at that? Oh, yes. Um, so Jim Newton asks, uh, do I know what algorithm was used for developing the current map? Reinforcement learning is a supervised learning, like a perceptron, like a neural net, it's some kind of expert system. Um, okay, so this is a great question and relevant um, because I would say the answer is going to be different in 2021 than it was in 2011. Um, so they used a system which I think is called Maptitude. Uh, it is not very fancy. So the words in this question, for those who don't know them, refer to like pretty advanced machine learning stuff. And I just want to say that making a gerrymandered map is not that hard. You need a little bit of time, but on your laptop and with Maptitude, um, you know, you can run through, you know, 10,000 maps in a minute and a million maps in a day. And if you look at a million maps, you can find one that benefits you a lot. And you can, you can tune, I mean, there are ways to sort of tune that process and more effectively uh, get to a situation that benefits you the most. But I just want to emphasize that um, basically the change is just that computers are faster and it's easier to manage like a few megs of data like that you might need to sort of have like shape files of every ward in the state of Wisconsin and be able to combine them pretty fast. So it doesn't need like modern machine learning. It doesn't need a neural net. It doesn't need anything 
fancy high test, like, you know, secret proprietary Google high tech. Nope. Like none of that. Like you could do it on your own laptop uh, with software that you could get off the shelf. Now that was, but it is a change because what I, all the stuff I just said, that's true in 2011. It's not true in like 1981. And actually I had an interesting talk with, uh, if you guys know Kevin Kennedy, who is about as old of a Wisconsin election hand as there is, the former uh, head of the, uh, I guess the, the elections board, who's been involved for a long time. He said in the old days, it's not been in gerrymander, but it was like some weird guy with a giant paper map who, hap who was like some kind of a savant who like knew everything about every ward and was sort of like very laboriously like, like, let me move this over here, let me move that over there. And it was a very analog process. And there was only so much you could do, right? Because it was limited by like this guy with his giant map and like what he knew. So uh, with the computationalization of this process, um, it made it a lot easier to make maps that were a lot more highly engineer but my impression is and i could be, hopefully i'm right i don't think we're any better at that i think i don't think you could do much better than we were already doing in 2011 like i remember in this north carolina map part of the congressional testimony they asked the um jim hoffler is now deceased but he was the kind of mastermind of republican gener gerrymandering uh in north carolina and he kind of franchised it nationally he, he trained some of the people here in wisconsin they said, why did you make, they were just trying to get a deposition to say, to motive, why did you make a map in North Carolina that gave 10 Republican seats and only three Democratic seats? And he said, because I couldn't get 11 Republican seats. That, that was his answer. And I think actually with modern analysis, like, yeah, you really can't. You really can't make an 11 and two map in, in North Carolina. There's just too many Democrats. You literally can't do it. Um, so I think already by 2011, I think we're already at, technologically at the spot where people are gerrymandering as hard as they can. Now, I think what's developed between then and now, and some of those charts I showed you, like that histogram I showed you, which is from Jonathan Mattingly down at Duke, um, I think the technology for assessing and detecting a gerrymander has gotten much better. So I think the kind of anti-gerrymandering tools uh, have improved between 2011 and today to the point that now I consider them quite robust. I have a question. Have a question. Mm -hmm. your, um, your random maps peak at 55. Is that because there are more Republicans than Democrats in Wisconsin? No, I would say it's because of this phenomenon of geographic concentration that you do have regions of Wisconsin, however you draw the map, there just are parts of Wisconsin, I live in one of them, that are 75% Democratic. Or even in the case of Milwaukee, like 80, 85% Democratic. You just don't have parts of Wisconsin that are 80% Republican. That doesn't exist. Like you go out to like very, uh, I mean, you can look at the wards and you go out to like very, uh, you know, very white, very exurban parts of Wisconsin. And they're definitely strongly Republican, but strongly Republican means they vote like Wyoming. Like maybe it's like 65, 35, you know what I mean? It's not, uh, it's not 75, 25, it's not 80, 20. I mean, it's funny because it's something, I'm just gonna spin off on that question a little bit. If you look at the rhetoric that you get from like somebody like Robin Voss, I don't wanna pick on the guy, um, but he's like one of the leaders of it. And he'll say like, I mean, he literally said after the election, you know, if you take out Madison and Milwaukee, Republicans would do a lot better in Wisconsin races. Well, that is true. If you throw out a third of the state and you leave a different two thirds of the state, it's a different state with different people in it and things are different. I'm not really sure what he meant to convey by that. Well, I know what he meant to convey by that. He meant to convey that somehow those places are not really Wisconsin and the real Wisconsin would vote in a way that he found uh, more agreeable to himself and his interests. Um, but I think it's interesting to say what is certainly true is that if you like look at like the regions of Wisconsin, um, you know, Madison area, Dane County more generally, and and uh, Milwaukee County are extremely strongly Democratic, and beyond that, there's most of Wisconsin 
uh, is moderately Republican, leans Republican. So you could say from Robin Voss's point of view, that says like, oh, there's just this like little Democratic part that are special, but most of the state is Republican. But you can look at it another way. What if you say like, where are there at least 40% Democrats? Like where are the Democrats actually out there involved? Like where are the Democrats? And actually almost everywhere in Wisconsin, there are 40% Democrats, but not in Dane County and Milwaukee County, the two biggest counties in the state. Those are areas which have essentially been abandoned by Republicans who like make no effort to represent those areas at all. So, you know, there's not one answer to who's there in most of the state. It's kind of, um, you can have a motivated answer depending on which, uh, which statistic you wanna use. I think in the end, um, the statewide elections are simplest. We have this one person, one vote principle. And I think any claim that sort of some people's votes are like a little bit less important than others and shouldn't count as much should be viewed with extreme suspicion. Thank you. And we've got one last question over in the chat from Rob. Oh, I see it. Okay. Uh, what is your prediction for the bias or lack thereof in the to be created 2021 map? Um, yeah, so what are these maps going to look like? Um, I would guess that the map that is drawn by the Citizens Commission uh, is probably going to be pretty good. I'm not really privy to exactly the protocol they're going to use. Um, I think that the map that, uh, that the, uh, the, the state legislature draws, and when I say by the state legislature, it will... I think, again, be drawn by a very small group of people under the direct supervision of Robin Voss and Scott Fitzgerald. So it won't, not even by like the Republicans in the legislature as a whole, like really just by those two guys and the people working for them. Um, I think that map will be extremely biased. I don't think they've made any attempt uh, to hide that that is their goal to elect Republicans. That is what they see. There's actually an amazing quote by a fellow called Tad Ottman, who was one of the people he works, he's a staffer for Fitzgerald in 2011. And he's one of the main three people who actually is in there uh, on the computer making the map. And he told Republicans, you know, I, you know, we have an obligation and an opportunity, we have an opportunity and an obligation to make these maps that will benefit Republicans as much as possible. An obligation, and I think that is, I think you stay in politics too long and I think you start to see it that way. And I think that's what's happened to Voss and Fitzgerald. I think they've kind of lost touch with the idea that their job is to translate what the people want into policy. And they've been in so long that they're like, it's my obligation to get Republicans as many seats as possible. My job here is for my team to win. To me, that's like pretty toxic in politics, to be honest. And I know it's like a feature of our politics. Um, but yeah, you, if I'm, you just ask my honest prediction of what they're going to do. That's what they're going to do because that's what they have done and that's what they've said they're going to do. And I see no reason to think they're not going to do it again. Whether that actually gets enacted and we vote according to those maps in 2022, that, as I said, is a different and much more complicated question and we'll just see. Excellent. Well, thank you so much uh, for joining us, everyone. And thank you so much, Jordan. This was uh, very enlightening <laughs> and a little scary, uh, but very interesting. So thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you guys for coming. I really appreciate it. All right. Thank you all. Have a great night.